Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this podcast, Bitcoin as a Portfolio Asset. My name is Elliot Johnson. I'm the CIO and CEO, COO of Evolve ETFs. Um, this podcast, we'd like to do something a little bit different than you might be hearing on a lot of other podcasts that relate to Bitcoin. We think that the technical features of Bitcoin are well discussed. We think that the macro concepts around Bitcoin are also widely covered. We may get into some of those in this conversation along with some Bitcoin news. But what we wanted to do here is try to fast forward a little bit from where we are today onto a subject that I think is only starting to get attention. And that is how to use Bitcoin as a portfolio asset. Uh, we think that this is a subject that could really accelerate if there are Bitcoin ETFs launched in the US, which is something that seems to be possible given the number of filings, especially from folks like BlackRock that we've seen in the past couple of months. And we think that when those ETFs come to market, this is going to open the door for Bitcoin to become an investment asset for a lot more people. And we think that this is going to be a uh, subject that gets a lot more interest from the likes of family offices, uh, from investment advisors, and also from the retail investors. So we wanted to start to add to that conversation with this podcast today. Uh, before we get into it, I'd just like to welcome everybody to this podcast. Thank you very much for joining us today. For those who aren't familiar with Evolve, please go to our website at evolveetfs.com. Um, just a very quick business summary for everyone. We celebrated our sixth birthday last week, and we're now at $7.2 billion in assets under management across 28 ETFs. And so our growth is something that we're deeply grateful to all of our clients and investors for supporting us along the way. This uh, webinar is really intested, uh, intended to uh, talk with the Canadian investment community, Canadian retail investors, Canadian investment advisors and family offices. This is not investment advice. Please do talk to your investment advisor before investing. But if you'd like more information about any of our products, please visit our website at evolveetfs.com. <clears throat> now, prior to starting Evolve, I was very lucky uh, to have a business partner, my good friend, Bitcoiner Greg Foss who is very well known in the Bitcoin community. Greg is a very sought after speaker, educator, and widely respected investor in Bitcoin. So first of all, Greg, thanks so much for joining this podcast. We're really, really grateful to have you here to discuss this subject. We think that you bring a unique perspective. And also, I think this is a subject that you've been talking about uh, a lot longer than most people. So rather than me starting out by butchering your bio, could I start by asking you to introduce yourself, provide a little bit of background, um on yourself please well firstly thanks for having me elliot um congrats on that uh milestone with evolve etfs uh that's a fantastic uh, achievement and yeah you uh you mentioned that we've worked together in the past um uh, i was lucky enough to work with you and a team uh started as gmp investment management and eventually uh we were purchased by fiera but um in that share, I was I built on my uh, history as a credit trader, and it was right in the midst of the financial crisis of two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. Our CIO at the time, Jason Marks, was uh, a prior um, boss, I would say, when I worked at TD Securities. He was the chief risk officer at TD Securities, and Jason. Uh, as CIO combined the ta the talents of the equity uh, team at GMP Investment Management, many people will know that to be Mike Weckerly, with um, a credit strategy that was uh, managed by myself uh, with the help of Paul Leibowitz and um, then some other strategies that uh, some of your some of your teammates at uh, Evolve are currently partnered, but. The long and short of it is I come at everything from a credit perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that credit runs the world. Uh, why? Well, first of all, it's the largest asset class in the world. Uh, secondly, the fiat system is based on credit. So fiat money is based on credit. And the centralized banks, central banks of the world, all they can control is credit. They don't control directly equity markets. So my experience of, uh, I like to say, you know, 30 years in a risk chair, 
Uh, I bring a viewpoint to uh, the Bitcoin asset class where I view Bitcoin as a absolute necessity in every portfolio. Uh, whether you're more weighted towards equities, more weighted towards fixed income, uh, it doesn't matter. Every portfolio can benefit from Bitcoin as a, as a non-correlated asset. Now, I need to be careful. Everybody's portfolio is unique. Everybody has their own risk tolerance levels. So maybe I'll start with my conclusion, which would be the only wrong allocation to Bitcoin is owning zero. You have to own some. And the question is how much ideally should an investor own? There's lots of tools we could rely on to tell various portfolios what they should own. But um, I like to come at it as Bitcoin is a unique asset that I believe can offer asymmetric return opportunities that I've never seen before in my investment career. I can't guarantee those investment returns, but I like the odds. I'm a math guy. I'm wearing my do the math hat, which is based on Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is based on math and code. And we could get into how, wherever you want to take this conversation. Well, but, well can I, sorry, yeah. no, finish off, finish, finish what you were going to say. Cause I, I want to jump off from that. Okay. I sort of lost my, my thought process. Okay. So I'll just say over to you, Ellie. Okay. So sorry. I, sorry to interrupt you there. I wanted to, I, I want to maybe try to, um, consider the journey of somebody who is new to Bitcoin because you've been really uh, working on Bitcoin pretty much full time now for how many years? Six years, seven years, it's been, you've been you're, you're into it. But can we, can we kind of zoom back out a little bit and say like, how did you go from being a credit trader, portfolio risk manager to discovering Bitcoin, to coming to the conclusion that you're at today where not only do you have this investment thesis, but you've also really decided to devote your life to helping educate people about Bitcoin. Like what can you, can you kind of go through that journey a little bit to, to help everybody understand the steps along the way for you? Sure. Well, I'll be very honest. I was introduced to Bitcoin and I was a skeptic like everybody. Uh, well, not like everybody, but like most people, Oh, you believe what you read in the newspapers. It's a Ponzi. It's uh, used by criminals, you know, the, the, uh, all, all the FUD, but luckily I didn't. Now let's be honest. I, I was introduced to Bitcoin by a gentleman by the name of Fred Pye, who uh, you, you certainly know. Some of your listeners may or may not know who Fred is, but Fred is a Montrealer like myself who um, uh, started 3IQ. And I was actually a founding shareholder of 3IQ. Now, Fred uh, introduced me to Bitcoin in Montreal, and I was a skeptic. But I was a mechanical engineer trained at, Mon at McGill University in Montreal. I went on and did a biz uh, finance, an MBA in finance after McGill. But understand that my technical or uh, initial training in universities, all about math. And I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm very visual. One thing that Fred Pye showed me that got me convinced of the beauty of Bitcoin, he showed me the blockchain in action. Now, there's lots of web pages you can go to. Tradeblock.com was the one I went to, where you actually see the mempool and you see the transactions getting uh, posted into the blocks. And the beautiful thing about it was being visual. I'm like, okay, okay, hold on now. Everything you've told me, fixed supply. This is a living, breathing organism where I can transfer value over time and space. And no central bank controls this. It's a decentralized protocol. I go, oh my goodness. This offers solutions to the fiat system that I've been concerned with since my 
first job at the Royal Bank of Canada in 1988, where I was working for directly for the CFO of the Royal Bank of Canada. We could get into that story, but the problems with printed fiat money, it can rescue the system, but ultimately it is the demise of the fiat system when you continue to print money. So I knew what the problem with fiat was. I didn't become a gold bug per se, but I appreciated the gold bug arguments. Then when I saw the Bitcoin blockchain in action, this living, breathing protocol, I said, wow, I better do more work. And I'm continuing to study Bitcoin and learning its beauty. And it's been a journey. And it's sometimes it's a trying journey because you're fighting all the, you know, you're fighting the IMF, you're fighting the World Economic Forum, you're fighting Jamie Dimon. And it's not that I have anything against those people per se. I just have a problem with their advice because they need the fiat system to continue because they're closest to the money printer. Those are the people that benefit from the fiat system. But generally, the further you are away from the money printer, the more disadvantaged you are by the fiat system. And this is something I've experienced over four financial crises in my life. And that's why I became enamored with Bitcoin. So, so, so on can I just say one thing? I do not want the fiat system to fail. I want you guys to be very clear. I am not rooting for the failure of the fiat system. What I am educating on is the shortcomings of the fiat system and how Bitcoin can solve these shortcomings uh, to the benefit of those who are not as privileged as those closest to the money printer. So jumping off from that point, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing with Looking Glass Education? Because you're a founder of that um, organization, are you not? And what are the ambitions for that project? Because that's kind of aligned with helping those who have the least, isn't it? Yeah, it absolutely is. And that was a beautiful intro. So Looking Glass Education was a um, an idea that was uh, supported by a few of my friends in the U.S. Uh, originally a doctor in Wisconsin who said, Foss, I read your research paper. I loved your research paper titled, and I'm just looking at it in the corner of my eye, Why Every Fixed Income Port, uh, fixed in income investor needs to consider Bitcoin as portfolio insurance. And this was the paper that I wrote on the subject. And he goes, I love your research, but it went way over my head. Now he was a doctor in Wisconsin and he goes, can we rewrite the paper? Cause I focused that paper on fixed income professionals, um, more for the common person. And this platform evolved to the point where we attracted other individuals who wanted to do research on Bitcoin. Now it's been out for this platform has been in existence for three ish years to the point where it's now being used in El Salvador. Some of the research from looking glass education is being used in El Salvador to teach in the uh, uh, elementary school system in El Salvador. So that's how it evolves. Pardon the pun. It evolved. Okay. Uh, from initially just an idea to where I helped to sponsor and fund this platform. The main players now are a Canadian by the name of Seb Bunny. He lives in Whistler, uh, Aussie guy by the name of Daz Bay. He lives, uh, I've never met him personally, only by Zoom calls. Great man. And then a Colombian lady who lives in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, by the name of Dahlia Platt. And Dahlia has been instrumental. She was the resource that put together this uh, education manual called My First Bitcoin that's used uh, in the education system in uh, El Salvador. So, you know, this Me, Me Premier Bitcoin is now been uh, translated into many different languages all around the world. And it's neat to see how this uh, 
this uh, growth, exponential growth in this in this platform. But I'm proud to be involved in it from the outset. But let's be clear: the only thing I really did was write an initial paper. I've helped uh, Seb. We've published, co-published uh, a couple of Bitcoin Magazine um, articles. One that's very I'm very proud of called why Bitcoin is the perfect option. But long story short, this is what's the beauty of the Bitcoin community. You get people who want to help. They join the platform. The platform expands to the extent that this is now a global product. And uh, those three people are running it. Uh, amazing. Well, I think there's a lot to be proud of in, in incubating that idea. And I'm sure you're being overly modest because I know there's a lot of other projects that you work on to further the conversation. And, and, and to some extent, this podcast is a bit of a riff on the Nakato Nakamoto Gauntlet podcast that you also have just um, uh, started out. Uh, I think there are two, maybe three episodes that you've already done for that podcast. Well, you were our first guest, Elliot. So, well. <laughs> uh, so that's the, you're the inaugural guest on that. And I'm, a, I'm just a participant. But that's run by a firefighter out of uh, out of uh, San uh, Santa Monica, uh, California, right? And and this is so the cool thing about this: people wanting to educate. And if I may build on that, they run the portfolios of major pension plans through that Nakamoto portfolio. When you were our guest, we ran Ontario Teachers Pension Plan through that portfolio to determine an optimal portfolio allocation for teachers because of the non-correlated uh, components of uh, Bitcoin and the enhanced asymm asymmetry of the return profile. So, you know, this is real life stuff where, and, and, you know, you get to know people. And so that firefighter, it was his idea, but the programmer was actually the CIO of Swan Bitcoin. Um, that you've met as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I, I have to say it's been a heck of a journey um, meeting a ton of great people. And, um, you know, we get to, I believe, participate in something that will help future generations immeasurably. And that's what I'm proud of. Absolutely. Uh, there's no question about that. I, I just saw a question, somebody asking, what's the podcast name again is called the Nakamoto Gauntlet Podcast. You can find it if you follow Greg at Foss Greg Foss on Twitter or my Twitter um, at Elliot Evolve ETFs. Um, but uh, we'll also try to include a link in the uh, description around uh, this podcast when we post it up online as well. Um, but highly recommend it. What I like about that podcast in particular, Greg, it's taking a view of how to talk to institutional investors, right? So Dom and the other folks on that that team, they're really focusing on the big pension plans in the US, which is where they kind of are, are, you know, that's where their background comes from. And they're trying to say, how does Bitcoin fit for them? So I want to take a little bit of a different view here because our audience is the Canadian investor, our audience is the Canadian investment advisor. And so I know any question we ask about Bitcoin is a rabbit hole we can go down for, you know, hours on end. So, you know, I want to try to keep it, um, uh, keep it at the right uh, context for folks. So I think the assumption, let's, let's assume our audience is um, an investment advisor in Canada with a large book of business with a variety of clients across all different demographics in terms of young clients and, and older clients and so forth. And we want to try to focus in on, okay, how would you start to think about Bitcoin as a portfolio asset? So back over to you, Greg. Um, this kind of my first question here is in, in a lot of investors, portfolios and they're thinking about their uh, investments, they, they kind of take buckets, right? They take a bucket approach of stocks and bonds, the, the classic 60-40 portfolio. Yes. They may also think in a view of risk on versus risk off. Now, I think setting context is critical here because Bitcoin has had um, a kind of famous rise in the sense that it's had a lot of headline news. There's been a lot of different kinds of things um, people know about it. I think it's known for volatility, although, you know, if you only learned about it this summer, you might not understand why that is because it's not been volatile lately. But nonetheless, I just want to start with, like, if you're coming at Bitcoin from the standpoint of having been an investor for a long time, you're very sophisticated, but this is a new asset class to you. What are the ways you should think about Bitcoin as an ingredient in the classic investment portfolio that a 
you might put together for a client, um, you know, say somebody who's working age, looking to retire in 10 years, maybe they got some kids, stuff like that. Like how, how should you think about this in the context of a practice like that? Bitcoin is many things to many people, but I talked about my history in the credit markets and for Greg Foss, I like to think of Bitcoin as being insurance on the credit system, the fiat based credit system. And in that light, I don't want to get too technical, but I've used credit default swaps on sovereign debt to value Bitcoin, to provide an intrinsic value for Bitcoin. And that model can actually be accessed at nakamotoportfolio.com, which is the website that was based on the Nakamoto gauntlet, right? Um, that we ran the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan portfolio through. But again, keeping it at a level, I like to think of Bitcoin as insurance on, and I'm not calling for the collapse of the fiat system, but there are certainly economies, fiat-based economies and fiat systems around the world that have collapsed. Uh, I like to say that Argentina has collapsed four times in my career. I'm not proud of that, but imagine being an Argentinian who's basically fiat system has uh, defaulted uh, four times in your life. Uh, it's very hard to get stability and people will say, well, don't worry. We live in Canada or, you know, we're a G7 nation. I hate to say it, but of the G nations, the G7 nations and lower, meaning, you know, G1, G2, Canada's at the highest risk of financial uh, calamity of all those other countries. It's the smallest of the countries. It's got, while we are a very large trading partner of the USA, it's got inherent problems in the, in the system. And I'm not calling for the collapse, but you need to protect yourself against something that's happened in Turkey, which is a G11 country. So that means we're only four notches removed from Turkey in terms of the size of our economy, where the Turkish lira has experienced all the problems they're experiencing. And if you look at the performance of Bitcoin in Turkish lira, it's astronomical. It's everybody always looks at the trading pair of Bitcoin versus the US dollar. But when you break it down into the individual fiat currencies around the world, the uh, performance is vastly different based on the trading pair of the U.S. dollar versus the Turkish lira, for example, U.S. dollar versus the Argentine peso. Long story short, I view Bitcoin as insurance. Now there's other people out there that would call that nonsense, including... Well, I won't name names, but that's fine because Bitcoin is something different to them. Mm -hmm. But when you manage portfolio risk, you need to have non-correlated assets and understand this carefully. I don't want to get too technical. Assets that are short volatility assets versus assets that are long volatility assets. And a long volatility asset doesn't mean the asset itself is volatile. It actually means that when the VIX increases, all short volatility assets are getting crushed, equities, all sorts of private investments, real estate, but long volatility assets, meaning when the risk, the VIX rises, increase in value. And it used to be treasury bonds, it used to be that long volatility asset against the short volatility assets of the world. Treasury bonds in the recent interest rate climate are not that protection anymore. I believe that Bitcoin is. Now, be careful. Just because I believe it doesn't mean it will react that way. And there's a lot of education that's needed for the world to understand that Bitcoin is a long volatility asset, which means it's insurance. That's a FOSS definition. But since Bitcoin is decentralized, cannot be printed into infinity, is not controlled 
by any CEO or central banker. It possesses a protocol that I believe is insurance that can't be messed with, right? It's not like, oh, we're going to change our mind on what Bitcoin is. So I hope that helps. It's certainly you can look at the correlation of Bitcoin to other assets out there, equities, treasury bonds, real estate, private equity. And you can draw your own conclusions as to what the correlation is and what, you know, what sort of protection it can provide as a non-correlated asset. But from a credit guy, the biggest thing I'd like to leave you with is that actually is insurance. And by definition, insurance is a long volatility asset, which as the world riskiness increases by as measured by the VIX, over time, I believe Bitcoin will be viewed as not a risk off asset, but an asset that performs well in a risk off world and therefore provides portfolio diversification benefits. Long answer, Elliot, hopefully no, I kept it as simple as I could for, but when you manage money, you need to understand these terms and that is imperative. Well, listen, you were sitting in a risk chair during the great financial crisis. I know because I saw you there and mm -hmm. I know you uh, you come by your wisdom through a lot of scars along the way, uh, having seen so many things that have happened over time. So many, I mean, how many once in a lifetime events do we have to live through in our career? It seems like there've been quite a few of them in the past 15 years. Um, but can I, can I probe a little bit, if you don't mind, on the uh, the notion of insurance and, and a hypothetical question, because you said you don't want the current system to collapse. No, of course, nor do we. Of course, I don't think anybody in our audience does. But typically with insurance, you only collect the payday if, you know, your house burns down. And I'm wondering, is there also an element to this story where um, the crisis we experience as a result of money printing? happened slowly enough over time, just as inflation has happened slowly since, you know, 1971, the U.S. going off the gold standard, where I think most people looking back from 19, from 19, 1971 from today probably would say, well, the world didn't come to an end along the way. But is there a scenario or what are the other scenarios where there is there there may not be specific acute crises, but Bitcoin continues to be a real value add to investors? in their portfolios um, through the various different bull and bear market cycles. So when you look at the credit system and you understand the reality that the only way to fund the debt spiral that we're in globally is to print more money in all fiats, knowing that fiat money printing is the error term that solves the debt spiral. You need to protect yourself against that certainty. And I believe you protect yourself against that certainty with hard assets like gold, like real estate, but also like Bitcoin. So you can argue that US treasuries are a risk-free asset, right? That's what you're taught in school. But if they're risk-free, why is there a credit default swap market quoted on U.S. sovereign debt riskiness? Well, obviously someone says there's a possibility, not a high probability, but a possibility that the USA could someday default. Not high, but not zero. So therefore, it's not a risk-free asset. Why is it not risk-free? Well, if you look at the current debt metrics of the United States, you will see that we are in a mathematical certainty of the debt spiral accelerating, okay? We've put on more debt in the last, since the COVID crisis, than it took the first 100 years of the U.S. to accumulate. Statistics like that, U.S. GDP to uh, debt, not just the USA, but total global debt to GDP. Play a 
It's a fun game. Total global debt to GDP, according to the Institute of International Finance, just came out at approximately 3.5 times, which is to say the total global debt is three and a half times global GDP. Elliot, what's a good coupon we could put on that debt? It includes debt everywhere. Is it fair that we put the US 10 year rate on all debt around the world? Sure. I'd say so, because there's only one yeah. entity that borrows at the US 10 year rate in US dollars. It's called the US right. government. So that's the lowest coupon there is. And that's four and four and a half percent today. But let's make the math even easier. We'll keep it at 4%. What's 3.5 times 4%? It's 14%, yeah. isn't it? Is it likely since the numerator is three and a half times the size of the denominator, global GDP, is it likely that the numerator which is growing at a 4% coupon, but relative to the denominator, it's four times as big. So it's growing at 14% relative to G G global GDP. Is it likely that global GDP is gonna grow at 14% to keep pace with the, uh, the numerator? No, <laughs> it's not even, it's, it's remotely possible, but it's not likely at all. Which is to say, your numerator is growing organically because of the interest coupon. And the denominator is not keeping up, which means your tax base is not keeping up because that's your GDP, which means where do you get the money to pay for the incremental debt? Where do you get it? Got to print it. You got to print it, ladies and gentlemen which is the certainty of the debt spiral, which means that fiat money will continue to debase over time. So it's your insurance against credit collapse, but it's also your defense against a certainty of fiat debasement. And that's where the real value comes in because it's the hard asset that helps, you know, it provides so, you your insurance, your peace of mind, but it also pays off in the short term because it is your fiat debasement hedge, the scarcity of Bitcoin, the 21 million coins. It's such an elegant way to put it. And, and do you find that that conversation, because you have this conversation all the time with investors, is this becoming an easier discussion now that we're living we've lived through the inflation of the past couple of years like do you think that there you know people are kind of in the west are waking up to what people in turkey have been experiencing for quite a long time and people in uh parts of south america who've had weaker currencies for a long time is it is it something where um canadians are more aware of their loss of purchasing power and kind of the second part of this question um do you think that makes it easier to put Bitcoin into a long-term portfolio? For example, you have a child, two years old, RESP, you know that you've got 16 years before you need to go get that money. You don't know what it's going to cost for that kid 16 years hence. Is it, is, does Bitcoin have more value for people who have that kind of time horizon? Because you know, one of the things I get feedback on all the time is people who kind of laugh and say, well, I thought Bitcoin was an inflation hedge, but you know, it went down last year when inflation went up, so it didn't work. And I, and I just wonder like, what's the reaction to that? How, how, how do you think people's time horizons and time frames need to be uh, set up for the sake of what you just said about the positioning of Bitcoin in a portfolio? Yeah, the answer is yes. Look at M2 money supply as your true inflation over time now with this quantitative tightening and all the uh verbiage that the U the usa puts out uh on reducing the fed's balance sheet or whatever if you look right into everything over time m2 money supply grows at about you know seven or eight percent annually over time now there is a little blip down right now, but it can't continue because I just told you why it has to continue to 
solve the, the debt spiral. So it will pick back up and it's something I call QE infinity, quantitative easing infinity. And so you can look in the short term, okay, well, yeah, an inflation hedge. I think you need to look more closely at the M2 component of it. Bitcoin is a M2 money supply or M2 inflation hedge rather than CPI. So I'm not sure if you guys know who Jeff Booth is, but good Canadian Bitcoiner friend of mine. He wrote a great book called The Price of Tomorrow, and it's based on why, uh, why we should actually be living in a uh, deflationary environment because of technology. So why is CPI, which measures a basket of goods and services, lower than M2 monetary inflation over time? It's because of things like technology, the advancements of technology, the price of an iPhone, the price of a computer going down versus other things in the basket. That's one. And then the other one is that the methodology continues to change in the calculation of CPI. They substitute hamburger meat for, for steak renters, owners equivalent rent, all these things. The point is CPI in itself is a difficult measure to, uh, to absorb. That's why I go back to the M2 component of monetary inflation. So Jeff Booth said correctly, technology is deflationary, but what is inflationary? M2. So all of this is uh, important to understand that you're measuring, you need to measure it against a long-term measuring stick, not a CPI adjusted uh, a component, you know, core non-food and energy. Well, if you don't need food and you don't need energy, you're just fine. You know, these things are the reality of the system we live in. Um, so I prefer to say, please look at it over the long term against the reality that M2 inflation is pure math. It's a great way to think about it. And I, I do think the, uh, the conversation shifting after last year's bloodbath in the bond market, after last year's large amount of inflation, um, combined with some regulatory progress in big economies like the US really sets up this conversation about Bitcoin as an asset class in a way that I don't think we could have had this conversation four or five years ago. Okay, I'd like to shift gears a little bit. I want to ask you about the Bitcoin itself without getting into technology discussion, because I don't think we're the right people to have that conversation. But if you are an investor and you say, okay, boss, I'm sold, I'm with you, got it. I definitely agree with all the problems with the world. And I see Bitcoin, the 21 million, I know, and I understand that. But you start to see stories about things like lightning payments. How much of the Bitcoin opportunity is based on things being built on top of Bitcoin? I know you also run, you can be happy to have you please uh, share a little bit about your new hedge fund venture where you're looking to make investments in the Bitcoin ecosystem. But is that a place that in advisors and, and investors need to be looking at? Do they need to look at the ecosystem of things being built on it? Do they need to know about Bitcoin mining companies and think about them? Or like, where does that element come into the picture beyond just the scarce supply? Because there's a lot of other excitement going on in Bitcoin. It's why I love talking about it. I think it's why you love talking about it. It's why I love meeting the people in the Bitcoin community. So can you talk a little bit about that and how that intersects with the investment case? Sure. Well, um, other people will value Bitcoin. I value it as credit default swap insurance, right? Uh, other people will value it based on adoption and compare it to adoption of the internet, compare it to the adoption of cell phones. And specifically, I'm talking about Fidelity Investment Research, which uh, Timmer, Yuri and Timmer, uh, the head of research, uses an adoption technology compared to uh, those other uh, technologies 
and actually puts a price target on Bitcoin that's almost unfathomable, even to me. And I'm pretty much a Bitcoin bull, but, uh, you know, they measure Bitcoin uh, over time at valued per Bitcoin in the many millions and in certain cases, more than $10 million per Bitcoin, which is like, whoa, like I know asymmetry in, in price is a possibility, but they're basing that purely on adoption statistics. And I'm not going to argue with that. Their model is different than my model. Uh, their training is different than my training. And what I would just say as simply as I could is there's many different models that go into pricing Bitcoin. But certainly you have to consider adoption and the technologies that are being built on top of Bitcoin as value enhancing to the network. Okay. So these types of network considerations for adoption, of course, it's a model. There's somebody who famously said, all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? So you take the FOSS model, you take the fidelity model, you take uh, plan B's uh, model, which is uh, based on um, uh, S2F, the these are all inputs into a calculation methodology for the value of Bitcoin. But absolutely, network effects, technolo technological network effects have to be considered as an input. So um, I'm reading a note here. This could be from our friend Sean Cumby. Uh, more investors own Bitcoin than ever before. There are now over 49 million Bitcoin addresses and over 1.2 million addresses with at least one whole Bitcoin. But uh, according to AAA estimates this year, since the start of the year, on-chain entities and transactions have strengthened while economic value in dollars has fallen considerably. So... You have to understand that these network impacts are all in the context of a certain supply. This is the coolest thing about Bitcoin. There's 21 million of them, defended by the most secure computer network, if you will, in the world. And you have this scarcity, defined scarcity that you could bring in, I said S2F, stock to flow calculations, one model. Lots of people don't agree with it. Some people do. You can bring in network effects. You can bring in insurance pricing, all of which adds to the market for Bitcoin. Is it rich? Is it cheap? Should you own some? And I am enamored with the technology absolutely but come on guys i just turned 60. don't go to me to understand technological wisdom much like you shouldn't listen to charlie munger when he says that bitcoin is rat poison uh all due respect to a 90 year old man who's done incredibly well in the financial markets um i wouldn't get te technological advice from him uh, and, and that's what makes things so exciting in the Bitcoin community is the technology, the network effects, intrinsic value measured as I like to look at it versus how stock to flow models look at it. Elliot, no one can define what Bitcoin is because it is Bitcoin. It is a new 14 year old technology and protocol to transfer value over time and space, which is so valuable, not to me and you, well, more to you, but to me, I'm 60. Like I own Bitcoin. Why? So I can give it to my kids. Okay. Because I believe Bitcoin is one of the most important te technological advances in the history of mankind. I also believe it to be insurance. I also believe it to be Bitcoin, it's the only digital asset that is truly decentralized. You have other crypto assets and you can play around with those if you want. 
but only Bitcoin provides me the protection I'm looking for to the fiat system that I have grown up in and have concerns about its reliability over time. So Bitcoin, not crypto. Bitcoin, not blockchain, okay? Blockchain technology exists only for decentralized systems. And Bitcoin for the kids. That's the most important thing. For the people in Africa that now have, uh, that are unbanked, that can now have a bank account on their phone, right? All of this is just beautiful stuff for a fat white guy from Canada who's spent a lot of time in the in the trading pits of the fiat markets and it's scary it is really scary there were times taking the train the go train in toronto going to work with you in the morning in march of 2009 and we you know we had good positions on we were in a good spot and i'm like oh my god i'm so nervous the world is going to end and we were close you guys don't i'm not pulling any punches and it'll take me all the way back this is important and I don't want hate mail. I'm going to tell your advisors this. I don't want hate mail. But I get concerned with the reliability of the Canadian banking system. And I'm not out there. I'm not ambulance chasing. I'll just tell you that my first job coming out of business school in the U.S., coming back to Canada, was working for the CFO of the Royal Bank of Canada. Directly for him. And I examined the Latin American debt portfolio of the Royal Bank of Canada because of a plan that U.S. Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady had put into effect called the Brady Bonds. My job was to pick the option that the Royal Bank of Canada was going to take for their transfer from five-year loans to Mexico into a new instrument called a Brady Bond. It was an amazing solution but all it was was accounting gimmickry because when you did the accounting the true accounting and if you had marked to market the loans of all the latin american debt that the royal bank of canada owned the book value of equity was vaporized and that is a very scary position when you're just coming out of school and you're like uh canada's largest bank is actually insolvent oh my god and it wasn't just the Royal Bank. It was all the money center banks in the U.S. Chase Manhattan, which is now part of J.P. Morgan. Manufacturers Hanover, which combined with someone else. I don't remember. Chemical Bank combined with someone else. But banking is banking. Banking is 25 times levered to its equity capital base. It's risk absorbing equity, which means you have 25 times the amount of risk dollar for dollar, then you have risk absorbing capital. Don't you think that that 4% to 6% equity capital can get vaporized on a regular basis, on a mark to market basis? And the answer is yes, it can. And it's happened four times in my career. So it's not just protection against country, it's protection against the banking systems in countries. It's protection against the um, events that take down uh, some of the regional banks in the USA, right? That we've seen happen. So look, we have a lot of risks in the fiat system. And it's my opinion that in every investor needs protection against these risks. And that protection comes in the form of Bitcoin insurance, if you believe that. But what I would encourage, and this gets back to my portfolio allocation. If I could convince you to hold 5% of your portfolio in Bitcoin, I know what's going to happen. You're going to look every day at the value of that Bitcoin line item in your portfolio and forget about where the other 95% of your portfolio is invested. And what I encourage you to do is get up to a portfolio weight in Bitcoin that's manageable from your ability to sleep at night. But more importantly, don't focus on the 5%. Understand the risks that are inherent in the other 95%. How much bank stocks do you own? 
two years ago when I wrote my paper, I'm like a pound the table sell on bonds. You have to get out of some bonds and into some Bitcoin. Well, that was pretty timely from the point of view that interest rates have gone straight up and long-term bonds have actually been destroyed. I think the TLT is down 62% from its all-time high. That's a bond, a risk-free bond holding down 62%. Damn, Elliot, like we're in new, a new paradigm, different interest rate, different valuation methodologies, different players, and Bitcoin can protect against a little bit of all of that. And um, yeah. Well, that's that a great, be- okay, so that's a great jumping off point. For, so I wanted to, we're, as we come to the course of the end of the uh, podcast, I wanted to play a little game with you if you're up for it. Okay? All right. So this is a game everybody can play who's listening. Um, and uh, there's, uh, it's okay if we, don't know all this stuff off the top of our head, but I want to put in context Bitcoin and just one particular element in terms of thinking about what goes into a portfolio. So I'm gonna play again. I'm gonna name something, and then you're gonna say, is it bigger or is it smaller than Bitcoin's market cap? Okay? Yes, sir. All right, big six Canadian banks combined market cap, bigger or smaller than Bitcoin? Bitcoin's at 500 billion-ish, Five, US. 550, yeah. 550, okay, 550. Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin's bigger than the big six Canadian banks. Correct. They're about 413 when I checked yesterday, okay. U.S. dollars. I'm doing this on U.S. dollar basis. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, Apple computer. Smaller. Uh, actually bigger, 2.7 trillion U.S. dollar. Oh, no, no. Uh, so I mean, Bitcoin is smaller. B- oh, Apple sorry, is bigger. Yes, yes. Apple. Yes. Too. Sorry. Okay, we play that way. It's great. Okay. Apple is bigger. Yeah. So you, obviously... Um, you got okay. The gold market is gold bigger or smaller market cap than Bitcoin? Uh, it's depending on who you believe about 10 trillion, so it's about 20 times the size of Bitcoin. And I bring that up because some people say that's another valuation method for Bitcoin. They just look at Bitcoin, look at gold, and say, if this becomes that, there's your 10x right there. Yeah, it's just another number you see flying around 20x. Okay. Sorry, I don't, I don't mean sorry. to pick sorry. it, but it, no, the 20X. no, no, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, maybe some more esoteric ones. Total deposits across, across Canadian credit unions. Oh, it's got to be, it's got to be, Bitcoin has to be bigger, but total deposits. So I could reverse engineer what my answer should be because based on it, what the bank's uh, market cap is and the leverage to deposits in the bar- bank's market cap, uh and then put a credit okay so you said 400 billion so that should be 10 tr- oh hold on a second i don't know i'm gonna claim i don't yeah, know the answer to that your, in, your instincts were right canadian credit union deposits right? the estimate i researched was 190 billion us okay plus, so so bitcoin bigger at 550. um okay an easy one canada's total bond market um Canada's total bond market, uh, total credit market, or just total government of Canada bonds? Uh, it was um, total debt securities. It was a visual capitalist slide. So I, I'm. it could be not as accurate as you would like it to yeah, be. Yeah, I'm going to have to ask uh, for forgiveness on that one. I could do the math on GDP. I could yeah. do and say that the U.S. is 30 trillion, blah, 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 3 trillion. Um, I'm going to say it's smaller, but, uh, Bitcoin is smaller. Bitcoin, Bitcoin is, smaller. is smaller. Yeah. So this, this stat was 4 trillion. So just to put that into context, I was going to say uh, 3 trillion ish, but that's yeah. fine. Yeah. So, so call it seven, eight times bigger is the bond market. But by the way, part of the reason I'm bringing all of this up is because if you think Bitcoin isn't big enough to use, you, you know, maybe you haven't looked at how big it's already is because yeah. it's starting to get into the stack rank of things that people are using all the time when they go into the markets to select securities for their portfolio. Uh, okay, a couple more. Uh, the size of the total size of the Canadian ETF market, something close to our heart here at Evolve. Do you know wow. the total size of the Canadian ETF market? Okay, I'm going to reverse engineer this one. What, re- what, portion of the Canadian ETF market is Evolve? <laughs> I think we're about 1% a little bit. All right. So 100 times yeah. 7 billion. Yeah. So Bitcoin is smaller than the entire ETF market. Uh, 
No, I because you're seven bigger. billion, aren't you? We are seven billion, but also it's uh, our half of our assets oh. are not ETFs. So divide by two, so it's actually bigger. Half of our assets come through okay. fun classes. See, we can Love tell people at least I didn't rehearse classes. this because no, I'm, no, sure. I'm trying to do math on the fly. I'm trying to do math on the fly. It's great. Uh, so yeah, Canadian ETF market is roughly 350 yeah. uh, Canadian, which is like 265 US. Uh, okay, Canadian government tax receipts, 2022 tax year. Uh, Bitcoin's way bigger. Bitcoin is bigger, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, that was about 308 billion US um, that, uh, that we took in uh, into the government in Canada. Uh, I'll finish with one final stat. Canada's crude oil exports. I got 2019 data, but so it's probably going to be a little bit bigger than this. But nonetheless, uh, is that bigger or smaller than Bitcoin? Well, total crude exports. So GDP, I'm going to go on the fly here. GDP equals C plus I plus G plus net exports. Okay. Yeah. If you guys don't know what I just said, you shouldn't be managing money. But I know a lot of people don't understand what I just said. Okay, so GDP equals consumption plus investment plus government spending plus your net exports and Canada's GDP. I have an idea of what it is and there's no way that net exports component of everything, let alone oil, is bigger than GD, bigger than Bitcoin. Correct. Yeah, so it's uh, 63 billion US uh, yeah. 2019 data. So you and I and guess I, I understand you why why you're uh, doing this exercise because you actually want to show how how substantial Bitcoin is. And here's the funny thing: I hate to say it, Canadians. I'm a proud Canadian. I love you guys. Canada doesn't matter. Okay, we just don't matter. Canada's economy is less than the size of California, people. Okay. As far as a G7 nation goes, yeah, that's important. But the beauty of Bitcoin is there's no borders. Like we can do all of this stuff on Canada to make Bitcoin look big. But Canada is a rounding error in the context of global economies. So therefore, there's a lot of things that mean Bitcoin is actually pretty small. And that's why it can grow to be so large. So you came at it from another perspective. To me, I come at it like this. Stick with me. We're almost out of time, but we might run over. Keep going, keep going. We'll okay. Keep going. Total global financial assets in the world are between 800 and 900 trillion US dollars. That's everything. It's total debt of about 350 trillion. And then there's real estate at about 300. And then there's global equities. And there's commodities, currencies, everything is about 800 trillion. It's actually higher. 800, we're going to use the low end. 800 trillion. What happens if Bitcoin gets 5% of that market, people? What's 5% of 800 trillion, Elliot? I hate to put you on the spot here. 5% uh, of 800 trillion is 40 trillion. boy. What's 40 trillion divided by 21 million? Oh my God. Okay. That means you can't do it. It's it. zeros. It's over 2 million of Bitcoin. Yeah. Therein is some simple math. If Bitcoin took 5% of your total global financial assets, that's a market cap of 40 trillion, of which it right now is 500 billion. 40 trillion divided by the fixed supply of 21 million. Right around 2 million bucks of Bitcoin, people. U.S. dollars in today's dollars. Okay, we're done here. That's your upside, asymmetric. Do the math. It's that simple. I would say very simply, don't own zero. Well, own I more than zero. So Greg, can I finish off just with a couple of uh, uh, questions in terms of helping folks figure out how to now get off zero? So when you're using Bitcoin for yourself, what are the formats you're using? Are you, is it all physical in a cold wallet, hardware wallet, are you using futures, are you using ETFs? What's the, what, how do you uh, recommend when people say, hey, how do I go buy it, Greg? Should I just get an account at an exchange? What do I do? It's a journey for everybody. But I love the fact that Evolve is part of a group of 
uh, asset managers and uh, platform providers that have provided a QSIP for Bitcoin. Because I want Bitcoin in my R RSP. Why? You get the tax advantages of it. And it's a long-term program. And it's got a QSIP. Thanks to Evolve and thanks to the Canadian ETFs. So I own those in my RRSPs. I also own Bitcoin in what's called cold storage. That's like my disaster, disaster insurance. Okay. But Bitcoin is a lot of things that can be used in different ways. And I own it basically. I own it on my iPhone, but not enough to care that if it gets hacked, if my iPhone gets hacked, not the Bitcoin blockchain, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to cry poor. I own it in cold storage, but my biggest allocation is in my Bitcoin and my RRSP in my Bitcoin ETFs. And that's just the way it is because you have an RRSP that you're used to trading other securities in that RRSP. And when Bitcoin has a secure uh, QSIP, it's like any other security in your RSP, with I, which I think is wonderful uh, to participate in the upside price potential of Bitcoin. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so just for folks who are watching, our Bitcoin ETF trades and the ticker EBIT on the Toronto Stock Exchange, that's EBIT, also available in EBIT.U. If you want to buy in U.S. dollars, you don't need to buy Canadian dollars to buy it. If you're starting with U.S. dollars, and you can trade the Toronto Stock Exchange. So EBIT and EBIT.U are ways to go about that. And you can get more information on those products along with all our other products that evolve ETFs.com. And so with that, Greg, I just want to ask you, where can people find you? How can people find out more about the stuff you're doing? Um, how should people follow you from here? Keep watching Evolve ETFs uh, and hopefully Elliot and I will do more spaces like this. Uh, I am on Twitter. I've developed a following, a global following on Twitter, which is unbelievable for a fat 60 year old. I've already used that line once, but uh, 60 year old white guy from Canada uh, has a couple, you know, over 100,000 followers on Twitter, which my kids think is ridiculously cool. Um, so you can follow me on Twitter at Foss, Greg Foss. Although, you know what, to be honest, I'm preferring to do more of these high quality direct uh, uh, presentations. Um, so I look forward to coming back again. Uh, you and I are working on various things in the markets, Elliot. I, I think of you as one of Canada's, um, uh, you know, trailblazers in the Bitcoin community. I'm happy to be associated with you guys, not formally, but just in terms of trying to further Bitcoin education in Canada. Um, I don't know, someday, who knows what different things Foss and, and Elliot could get involved in. But it is just to say, we're doing this with a sole purpose of providing access to what I believe could be the best asymmetric return asset in my 35 year career of managing risk. So uh, you can, you know, I, I'm on yeah. a lot of TikTok video. No, no TikTok videos. Sorry. Um, YouTube videos. The funny thing about my last name, Foss, it is Norwegian, but it stands for free open source software as well. <laughs> Isn't that the craziest thing that I was born with a name that says you, you were born for the tech industry? Okay. <laughs> Let's keep the education going for the benefit of Canadian kids, for the benefit of kids in Africa. I don't care where, uh, to be able to, uh, have an equal playing field where Bitcoin doesn't care. The price for Bitcoin is the same, whether you're close to a money printer or whether you're in Africa trying to buy some Bitcoin as a savings instrument. And that's what I love about the beauty of Bitcoin. So um, someday, 10 years down the road, knock on wood, we will have been vilified, or, you know, vilified, is that a good word or bad? We would have been um, uh, 
recognized for our uh, desire to get out and preach on ability for the world to benefit. Fix the money, fix the world. It's not just a saying. There's a lot of truth behind that. So um, uh, keep fighting the good fight. It's not a straight line. It's not hard to own 1% to 5% of Bitcoin in your portfolio. You got a lot of other places. There, there's a lot of hidden risks. And Bitcoin should be a counterweight to that. Thank you so much. Well, Greg, thank you. You're a complete legend. And we're so grateful you joined us for this podcast. And thank you for everything you're doing for Bitcoin education. Um, we're so grateful that you decided to come on and share your thoughts on this. And we hope it's been helpful to folks in the audience to hear uh, Greg's perspective on how to invest in Bitcoin. Uh, please do follow him at Foss Greg Foss on Twitter. Uh, you can follow us at Evolve ETFs on Twitter and on LinkedIn and come to our website at EvolveETFs.com. Let us know what you think of this podcast. We'd like to keep doing more of these. I think that there is a real change in the conversation around Bitcoin and it's time to be bringing smart minds like Greg with the experience they have to the conversation to find out how Bitcoin can help you help your clients. And so with that, thank you everybody for joining us today and uh, appreciate this and look forward to chatting with you in the next one. Thanks brother.